What I've learned is a superintendency will never, never be perfect. There is no perfection anywhere. Enjoy the job, conquer the job, and again, pay forward to the next generation. Produced by Podcast Architects. Welcome to a special Hallis episode of the Path Forward podcast. We're here in San Antonio with a very, very, very special guest and friend, Dr. Martha Salazar Zamora. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Rick, and good morning. Glad to be here. And now we're doing this a little different than we normally do. So we do have a audience behind us that are gonna participate and ask some questions, but this is an opportunity for us to dig in a little bit to your story, okay. where you've been, where you're going, and what you've been up to. All right. And there may be a little REO Speedwagon trivia <laughs> for you as okay. we go along. A little anniversary song there. So I want to start with your why, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass you here in a minute with the accolades and everything that you've done, but I want to start with your why. Why do you do this? Okay. Why do I do this? I am starting my 38th year in Texas public education. And I say all of those words with a lot of intentionality. Um, Texas, because this is the state that I've always lived in and, and have chosen to stay in. I've worked um, for the state of California as a consultant for a number of years. And although I've been tempted at times, it's never been enough to actually leave Texas. And public education, because I believe in public education. I'm not against parents making a choice. I understand that choices can and should be made for each individual family. Mm -hmm. But I believe that Texas provides the best quality education for all students. And so I'm very proud to say I've been a Texas public educator for now going on 38 years. Um, but my why? My why is um, really, I think, very basic. I think it's why everybody goes into education. It's a belief that you can make the world better, mm -hmm. that you can provide for a the next generation. The why evolves though, as we evolve as individuals and as, as leaders. My why has certainly evolved now when I look at the difference of what world am I preparing them for? When the reality hit that we are preparing students as educators, as leaders, as teachers, as support systems for the network in public ed, we are preparing them for positions that, for jobs, for occupations that we don't even know right. exist today. That's a little daunting. That's when you have to start really using that innovative, creative thinking about what will the world look like and what soft skills, we talk a lot about that in Tomball ISD, what will they need to best be prepared to tackle and not just do the job, but excel in the job, enjoy the job, conquer the job, and again, pay forward to the next generation. So in 38 years, I had to get my phone out because I have to read. <laughs> I have to read off some of this um, okay. every time I, I take a look or every time I see something. It makes me think about my my own life and like I mean, you need to get your act together. So this I'm gonna embarrass you. <laughs> okay. Just some of your awards. So the National S Superintendent of the Year finalist. Yes. There's only been three from Texas. Three in Texas in the entirety of the um, of the awarding. Yes, about 40 years. North Harris County Outstanding Woman in Education, yes. Texas Superintendent of the Year, yes. Region 4 Superintendent of the Year, Texas A&M Kingsville Hispanic Heritage Hero, Top 30 Influential Women of Houston, Distinguished Alumni from Texas A&M Kingsville. Yes. My alma mater, very proud of that. Go Javelinas. <laughs> Kingsville pride. <laughs> I've seen recently a district administration uh, that you were um, Featured in that is the what one of the 100 top educators in the nation. That was a big surprise and very exciting. Very honored. It, like no, the Nobel Prize when she was seven. The, <laughs> the I, I mean, Stop it. she she was with the Wright brothers and, and told them how to make it. Go. Like the list goes on. And on. But I'm I'm gonna. I heard from a little a little birdie that there's also a book. Yes. Okay, so tell I've, us. I've just completed um, a children's book in honor of my grandchildren, and we're working on the, um, the artwork for that. And uh, tomorrow, a book that I'm a part of, Latinx Radiance, is going to be released um, on Amazon. Very excited about that. So now you're an author? Yes. 
you, at some point, I, you got to let the rest of the world catch up with some of this stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, I thought I was doing pretty good just hosting a silly podcast, but all of those accomplishments, when did you know, when you, as you're going through K-12, as you're going through college, when did you know, I want to be an educator? Like, that oh. was the moment. So unlike most educators, I didn't really go up the traditional. I know, you know, individuals will tell you I used to, you know, have my dolls here and teach to them. I didn't do any of that. I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be an educator. I honestly didn't. Um, my story is I was born with a severe, profound um, hearing deficit. I did not have the three ossicular chains. Um, and so I was severely, profoundly deaf. And I, it's a very long story, but at the age of 17, I had um, an, an ossicular chain implant, which helped me. Um, and through my entire childhood, for many years, I had um, a speech therapist because of my hearing deficit. So I was a child in gifted and talented and special education, which is kind of a, a there's a balance there, right? right? And so I'm a huge advocate. My mother taught me my lifelong mantra of never let your disability ever be an inability, and I always remind people of that um, because we all have disabilities to some degree. Some are just more uh, prevalent and more noticeable and, and seen and heard. And so um, I remember my mother at, at a very young age always telling me, you can do anything everybody else can do, you will just have to work harder. And so that's something I try to remind every individual that I come across. You can do anything that you want to do, you may just have to work harder, inclusive of my own two children and two grandchildren. That's, if you work hard, then I think a lot of things you know, can certainly be accomplished. Um, I didn't grow up though saying I want to be a teacher. Right. I, I fell into education, but I love to say I fell in love with education. So I did start off as a speech pathologist. Um, it was my passion. Uh, it was what I knew. Maybe it was my comfort zone now that I look back. Uh, and then I went into uh, becoming an educational diagnostician and then education really, really happened for me. I have a, a habit, I'm trying to get better at it, but I have a habit of always asking that, that two-year-old question of why. Like, why? Why do we do this? Why do we do it this way? Mm -hmm. um, and in my career, every time I'd often ask the superintendent or somebody in charge, why do we do this? I somehow ended up with that position. That's how most of my jobs, yeah, really, oftentimes it was, oh, well, but why do we have an over-identification of specific students in special ed? Well, was director of special education. <laughs> why find, do find we, out. Yeah, Tell yeah, me. Why don't you fix that if it's such a problem? <laughs> but truly, many of my jobs, uh, my opportunities and positions came that way. Actually, my first superintendency in Keensville ISD, um, I did not get that job in a traditional way. Um, the superintendent there, who I, uh, Mr. Charles Greenwalt, who I liked very, very much, he, I told him I wasn't interested in the position, and I told the board that, and I meant it. Mm -hmm. um, I was the interim, did that for a couple of months, and they kept offering it and I kept saying, no, do a search, I'm too young. This was 25 years ago, very long time ago. And I kept saying, no, no, no. Ultimately, it was my husband, uh, Emilio. I, he finally looked at me and said, you know, they are going to find somebody else if you don't say yes. Uh, and it was a matter of, everyone has that moment where you have to look at yourself and figure out what are you so afraid of? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes somebody who, who loves you to say, you know, look yourself in the eye and really face your fear. And my fear was I couldn't do the job well enough. What I've learned is the superintendency will never, never be perfect. Right. There is no perfection anywhere. But I had it in my mind as a position you only did when you had conquered everything and you, you knew all the answers to all the questions. Well, that's, that's not possible, right? That's utopia. And so ultimately I did say yes. And it was, it's been, it was one of the best jobs I've ever had. Of course, I left my hometown. Um, and I think the board knew that before I did. I know Mr. Greenewalt knew it before I did. That was my biggest fear, was leaving home, I think, leaving my comfort zone. Um, but it allowed me an opportunity to grow and, and continue to do something I love very much um, at, a, at a more state and now a national level serving on, on AASA Executive Committee. So when you think about that, that fear that you had, and then if you fast forward to National Superintendent of the Year finalist, I'm just curious, like, what is that process like? Is it like they're just oh grilling you? Or are they, are you sitting up here in front of the crowd and they're throwing so, things at you? Like, how does the... I will not lie to anybody watching this. That is the most daunting experience. And I usually am not phased. Like, I'm, I don't really get stressed. My team will tell you that. My husband might not, but <laughs> <laughs> my team will. Um, it's just, um, I wasn't prepared for that. And I didn't really have other people I could ask. I was the, th the first female well, yeah. in the state of Texas to ever be in the finals and only the third um, educator. And so there weren't a lot of people you could just call. Um, 
I was just in awe of the whole process. In, in reflection, it was amazing, but it was scary. I'll use that word, and I don't use it often. I, it was a very scary process. You're there for a number of days. You're in Washington, D.C., and of course, you're at the White House and the NPR um, going through. You have a, a paper interview. It's a, it's a paper process, and then you go through the first actual phase, which is a face-to-face -face with a panel of prestigious judges. Um, and then you do a video interview where you're interviewed by a member of AASA. But then you do the NPR um, actual live questionnaire. So the four of us are there, and that's part of the interview process. And they ask questions A through Z, wow. um, and it's live. It's, there's no editing. Yeah. It's not there's like no, a podcast. Let me start over. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go, whoop, let Can me I start over? Rick that. screwed all that up. And right, right, right. It, and yeah. so you're also hearing your, your colleagues who have now become, we call ourselves a final four. Um, there's a big gala for us um, in the fall uh, in Washington, and so we'll get to, uh, to be back together again. We were uh, all honestly wanting our names to be called. Let's, you know, we're superintendents. Sure, sure. We, you know, we are competitive, but we were all cheering each other on um, and have become really good friends. So I feel like I've made some really, really close connections throughout the nation uh, through the process. But the actual process is grueling. Um, it's 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 a, a little bit of a mind game. Um, it's definitely a time crunch because you're running from one event to the next. Um, and um, it was not like anything I had ever been through nor ever want to go through again. <laughs> wow. So it was. It, it sounded like a lot of stress. Yes, going through. it was stressful. <laughs> Do you remember thinking all right, I'm, now I'm here and now I have these, these people that I've never met, right. that I've got to impress, that know nothing about me. What's your, what was your strategy? Do you, can you share a little bit about, all right, I'm just gonna dig into this, this, and this. Yeah, so the process um, of becoming superintendent of the year, first in your region and then in the state, is really a process of interviews, whether it's initial paper interview that leads to a face-to-face, -face, and then at the state level, it's two face-to-face. -face. So I just figured I would do what had been successful so far. I mean, really, if you're yourself, if right. you're your true authentic self, that should resonate. Uh, I didn't want to go in there and, and emulate something that I wasn't and then feel like I didn't do my best. Mm -hmm. And so I was really, really uh, proud of everything that went into um, that entire, I think it was almost a week, it's about five days, uh, and ultimately didn't know what name would be called, but felt Felt really good about that whole saying of left it all on the table because I didn't want to feel like I had regrets. I had no regrets right. um, after that and felt like what will happen will happen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And we're thoroughly proud. And to, it's kind of a shame that only the third. It, there will be more maybe in yes. this audience or watching. Yeah, so I want to go back to your career. At what point can you identify that when you're the most growth happened. Are there some things along your career like, man, this was really tough, yeah. but yeah. it was really good for I me. Can, uh, I can tell you that the first thing that came to mind. I think the most growth happens um, sometimes in the time of greatest challenge. Um, I haven't, I have learned from su great superintendents, but I've also learned from superintendents that weren't as great um, and who perhaps didn't have the same philosophical belief in how people should be treated mm -hmm. and how the work should be done. And I, uh, my stubbornness, my tenacity at times would make me continue to stick with it and feel like I could, I could either change the person right. or make something better. Um, but I think sometimes your greatest growth opportunity is when you recognize this isn't right for me. Everybody will be in a position where you're not happy or you're not growing or you're not giving all that you can and should. And sometimes walking away is the greatest gift ever. Um, but sometimes we're, we're trained and taught that you stick to it and you make it work and you, you know, that whole, you can do what everyone else can do. You just have to work harder. It's okay to walk away because sometimes for me, my greatest growth moments have come from maybe some of my biggest failures. Yeah, failure is not, um, not a bad word. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Makes you, makes <laughs> I mean, I don't up. want to have it often, <laughs> but you know, well, I th if I think, it happens every now and then. <laughs> I think the, I, your Nobel Prize is safe. You're, you're fine. I promise you. I'm so more funny, worried about Rick. my own stuff. Uh, <laughs> So when you get into a situation where it's like, man, this is just trying, I've not gone through it, who's your go-to? Other than Emilio, Yeah, I was going to say, well, he's kind of in the audience. Who's your go-to? Who's your, your network that, you, that we talk about with everyone? It's like, hey, you got to use your network. Who's your go-to? Um, so, I, you know, I don't know if I could say, oh, it would probably be a family member. Okay. You know, it, and, and I, I would say that when my parents, you know, my father has passed, my mother has advanced Alzheimer's. Um, if she's 
having a good day. It could still be my mom, but um, definitely my family. I would say not in absence of my husband, it would be my daughters um, who don't really know the world I live in in education, but they're very connected to it. Um, I have a lot of mentors and amazing friends and colleagues and coworkers that I could always go to, maybe for different reasons, depending on what it might be. Mm -hmm. um, and so just good people that understand the work we do and how hard it is um, and can help you process with, um, really with, without a filter, just listen to what you have to say. Everybody needs that, those people, right? They can tell you, that's a good idea. You might want to rethink that. Maybe not such a good idea after yeah, all. Yeah. Okay, so getting back to the action. <laughs> so you're the, you're the president, incoming president of yes. the Texas Association uh, of School Administrators. Yeah, TASA President Effective Saturday. And that was a lifelong professional goal. And so you sit on the board of, of our organization, Talis. Yes. You, you have all of these organizations and committees that you lead. Here's the question. Okay. How important is it to have your, your partner, your spouse be in, in rhythm Oh. When as busy as you are, like, can you talk, talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's really important for, for our aspiring leaders here. So I think as educators, there's a plethora of things you can be a part of, right? A to Z. Um, you have to decide what is the most important, where is the most value of time, and then decide where you can spend your time. Because there are really, you know, I haven't figured out how to have more hours in the day, although I wish I could. I haven't. So in my district, it's important. Um, I'm president for the state for the Fast Growth School Coalition because we're a very fast growth district yes. and we need those, you know, we advocate for the additional dollars. Um, I will, I'm president elect of the Texas Council of Women School Executives at the state, but also in region, region four in Houston. So I'm doing multi tasks there. Um, an association I believe very much in. I believe in empowering women to opportunities and positions that perhaps they don't see themselves in mm -hmm. and want to be in. Um, and very proud in the 100th year to be the first Latina to serve as president, um, which just, as we mentioned, just started this Saturday. So I'll have a one year term there. And there's other associations I'm a part of. So to your question, how do you balance all that, right? Um, well, we are empty nesters now. Um, our children are grown and, and live in Europe now with our grandchildren. And so I, I think the balance is just making sure that um, when you're with your family at this point with my, my spouse or with friends, that you balance what makes you happy outside of work. Because I love work. I am one of those people that one day I know retirement will come, but I'm not ready for it. I don't happen. want that. Um, and I know people count down the days and that's good. Everyone's different. I can't imagine the day that I can't do what I love doing I have the best job ever and I'm not ready to give it up I when you say retirement there's no way like that, <laughs> no, one day that, that will not happen <laughs> one day I hear that a lot <laughs> uh, I've, I've got a tacit question for okay. you okay so as incoming president do you get to go in and veto anything from Dr. Goffney <laughs> Had it, they had it in place. I kidding. would never do that. <laughs> no, Latanya is my sister soup. Um, no, it's not quite like that. We have an executive committee, and committee, we do sure. a lot of work, you know, of committee work together. Now we definitely will be having a, an officer retreat where we will make some big decisions. It's the centennial year. We have a lot of exciting things happening, but we're very fortunate that TASA has such an amazing uh, team of, of um, staff very members. Uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Brown and his entire team. They do such a tremendous job in the work that they do so um our work isn't necessarily as ceremonial right uh, but it, it is it is wonderful work that we do to support the over 1200 uh, school districts in the entire state of texas it's huge and, and you know we all uh, are, are members and participate and the the work that goes on there is, is critical well and tessa has grown so much i think it's been able to recognize you have large district opportunities you have small district opportunities we have future ready superintendent leadership network anything you want from mentoring really a to z and if there's something that we're not offering that uh the members would like just let us know and we'll look at ways yeah. in which we can offer that because it really is about supporting and lifting up just like thalas you yeah. know this association as a founding member we talked about that yesterday um as past president i believe in this association and we've grown we've evolved it's it's been a journey this has been a longer journey but it's been a great journey and just being here today is exciting and seeing this room full Excellent. Are we ready to take some questions? This question, this is a, an anonymous source. Anonymous, right. absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Z, you seem to be quite organized. The question <laughs> is, how organized is your closet? <laughs> Asking for a friend. Well, I am, anyone that knows me and works with me knows, I'm relatively organized in things that matter. I mean, <laughs> my trunk, off limits. You can barely squeeze a pencil in there. You could literally live off of what's in my trunk for a while. 
My closet is a different story. I will tell you a very quick story. Uh, many years ago, somebody broke into our home and um, it was very invasive and I was very upset and it was terrible. It was, we were living, it was an, an, many years ago. And um, the officers walked through the house and they walked to my closet and they said, well, it is evident they spent a lot of time in here. <laughs> and my husband, the sarcastic supportive <laughs> husband that he is said, oh no, it looked like that when, <laughs> when she left this morning. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's not, I don't put time, back to time management, I don't put time into things that don't really matter to me. I know where my things are, and I'm good with it. So, nothing, bless nothing, my mess. Nothing to see here, officers. Keep, yeah, keep it moving. Keep moving, keep moving. <laughs> that's a true story. Yeah. What are the challenges you have faced as a Hispanic female in education? So, um, I'll be, if I'm going to be truly transparent, I think it's um, at times people underestimate your ability. I think that's changing, but over the years, as a superintendent 25 years ago, I think I was a bit um, of a unicorn. Uh -huh. There weren't a lot of us, um, and it was always uh, wondering, you know, how much, how far you can go, how high you can, you know, what, what is it that you can do, what, what are your, what are your, what are the limitations? And maybe in hindsight, some of those limitations were put upon myself because I didn't get to see people aspiring and doing the things that I saw others doing, um, that I know people in this room and people watching are capable of and will accomplish in their future. Thinking about your career and where you sit now, if you could go back, time travel, what would yeah. you tell your younger self? Oh. Closet, clean the closet? Yeah. <laughs> no, don't waste time on things like that. Um, <laughs> I would just say, you know, do what you love and love what you do, and faith will always see you through. Biggest win that you've had in education? Oh, um, if, you had, say, if you had to pick one. You want to know? I do. I would say um, becoming the, the superintendent of Tomball ISD. Nice. The biggest win. Let me tell you why. Because you have to know who you are. Some people love big district. I've worked in large, the largest in the state. I've worked in Texas, had an opportunity to go back at one time. I've worked in Round Rock. I've worked in Spring. I've worked in, you have to know what works for you, what fills your bucket, what, what makes your heart happy. And to me, the larger systems are amazing and they are um, something to look up to. However, if it doesn't work for you, if it doesn't fill your bucket, if it doesn't make you happy at the end of the day, then it's not all worth it. The work we do is hard, but I love to do it with the team that I care about that I know, the team I'm looking at right now, I know about their families, I know what they enjoy and where they wanna go on summer vacation. Um, I believe in, in that family feel and maybe that's coming from Keensville, my hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, Tomball reminds me a great deal of that. I've had the opportunity obviously to go many places uh, every single year. If you do a good job, opportunities will come to you. And right. I often remind leaders that you're interviewing for that next job every single day you're doing a good job. I have people on my team that could be a superintendent no tomorrow. Question. They're looking at the right time for them and their families. And I remind people it's really about timing. Um, so as I reflect on my career, I am exactly where I'm meant to be because I'm happy there. I'm making a difference. We are, are truly transforming lives and being innovative while educating students as they learn to create the future. In Tomball, Texas, who knew? Lovely. <laughs> Last question. What's next? Oh. Um, not retirement. <laughs> um, I, you know, right now I have a couple of things that I'm thinking about, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta keep the cards I will understand. We'll see. Um, I will continue doing what I'm doing in a district that has given me so much, mm -hmm. um, that I enjoy with the, the team that I love working with. Um, but I do enjoy the national. So I do enjoy through AASA, um, opportunities to be able to, to grow and to learn. Doesn't mean leave. It just means opportunities right. to continue to impact, um, at the national level. I love Texas, but I love talking about Texas at the national level. I think our voice needs to be heard more nationally. Absolutely. And the 100%. great things that we're doing for Texas public education. A hundred percent. The, the work that you've done, the people that you've inspired, I am internally, uh, eternally grateful. Uh, the one thing that I think goes understated is, it, so we've just listed a ton of accomplishments and all of the, the work that you're doing. You always answer the phone. You, <laughs> no, no, this is, this is not, but this is not the norm. And, and a lot of people out there, I, I'm sure can back me up on this. There's some folks 
that you're trying to get help from and you're trying to reach out to, or you're going through something and, and when you text or when you call and maybe it's a hit or miss, yeah. right? I, n there's never been a time, whether it's just to crack a joke with you or, mm -hmm. or point out something or ask you a yeah. question or, hey, I'm in crisis, what do I do with this? Every single time, 100% of the time, you answer the phone, you answer the text. And to me, that means the world because that's really not how our world operates. And I know it's not just me that you do that with, I know you, you do it with everybody. And for, for me, I've always wanted to lead like that. I did not, I could never wanted to be a leader that didn't respond, that wasn't going to answer the phone, regardless of how far you climb up the totem pole. And I want to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I think it's important. We've all heard to, to whom much is given, much is expected. And yep. I believe that uh, even this morning, a mentee called and, and uh, my husband who has to be there when I'm answering these calls, she was concerned about her deficit budget and just needed one more, you know, just uh, support saying it's going to be okay. Many of us are writing deficit yeah. budgets. It's a difficult time right now. We'll get through this together. Um, I think it's important. And I, uh, I have had to call people and wanted them to answer the phone. And, it, and we have to support each other, um, not just in education, but, but overall. You Absolutely. know, it's be there for the people that, that, that need you and want a little bit of advice or just want to share some good news with you or just need to talk. Absolutely. I think if we spent more time doing that, perhaps we'd live in a better place. Yeah, help each other out a little bit more. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being brave and jumping on with me and, and with all of our folks in the audience. All right. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs>